today's guest. Um, no stranger, um, you would have seen her on EWTN, seen her all over the place online, um, but we're going to learn a very powerful message today about forgiveness um, and power of prayer and her strong faith in God. For all the way from Rwanda, now based in the United States, um, a survivor of the Rwandan Holocaust, and we're talking about 1994 when over a million people were massacred. She survived and she lives to tell the story. The author of the book left to tell none other than Immaculate Ibakidila Pegiza. I hope I got the pronunciation right. But uh, thank you for joining us, Immaculate. Thank you for having me. Truly happy. Um, what a what a blessing to have you. And you've been very busy over the last, wow, over 10 years now, 10, 10 11, 12 years. I've, I've, I've followed you, um, where you've been sharing your story across America um, uh, to the English-speaking world. But um, I'd like to introduce our audience, those who may not be familiar with your story, maybe we can start, and in the introduction, I mentioned the whole Holocaust um, and the, the genocide in, in Rwanda. Um, mm -hmm. Should we start, I mean, you are, um, your family, could we start at the beginning, a bit of your upbringing, and then what happened that day when it all began, and then and then we can go from there? Yes, it had been a, such a blessing of God to be able to, to go around the world to share and different languages, they always have it, people translating. So I have been a lot in South America is one of the places I speak to a lot. Uh -huh. So anyway, in a, I grew up in Rwanda in a place that is very close to a lake. We used to think it was a sea because it was a huge. And uh, my family, I we grew up Catholic. We prayed every night. We We were friends with the neighbors. I grew up just peacefully. I never really had any troubles like what I thought, what, you know, like what happened. I didn't think about that. And my parents were teachers. My dad was a director of Catholic schools. My mom was a teacher also. Every night we prayed before we went to, to, to sleep and we didn't have TV or radio or the telephone. So I still remember the early memories. We would just sit together every single night and, and share with each other how was the day. And we couldn't wait for our dad to tell us what the kids in, in the school did with what we also we did to share with each other. So it was joyful. However, in Rwanda, we had two main tribes, Tutsi and Hutu. And I remember the first time actually I realized that there was problem, problems. I was in a photo grade and my teacher who was from the Hutu tribe, who was a good man, who was not a good man, because there's many great people from the other tribe, from the Hutu tribe. But this teacher one time, I remember he told me, every week he used to say, Tutsi stand up, and the Hutu will stand up. It was painful because people would look at you, because we look alike. So people would yes. go like, you are Tutsi? And, and it was like a shame, and we were few. So it was always like a painful when I go to find out later. So me, I grew up, every time they say stand up, I would stand up with my friends. If they were Hutu, I stood up. If I were Tutsi, I stood up with them. This one time my teacher said, go outside and come back to school only when you know what tribe you are. I'm like, wow. what is the thing about that? But it was painful because I spent like four hours outside crying. He wouldn't let me in until my parents tell me who I was. So when they told me the name, I was Tutsi. I'm like, oh, fine, good. It's a good name. <laughs> but the next time we stood up, that's when I realized how other students were looking at me with other friends who were Tutsis. It wasn't fun. It was just like, ah, you are too few. And then they kind of surprised, like, what, you are? You know, so it was not good. So problems were there from the beginning. For maybe 30 years, it was the politicians, they prepared that to happen. They prepared discrimination. They use people because there's people don't hate each other because they are different. There is always a propaganda of the politicians, the propaganda of people, you know, whoever powerful, whatever they with their own self-interest, who used, who uses tribes, who use people. Otherwise, you, people we are attracted to people who are kind, no matter who you are, where you come from. Yeah. That's so true. What, yeah. So uh, since the, the, this was, how long was this division with these two tribes, the the, the uh, Hutus and Tutsis? What, has that been going for many years in your upbringing? Yeah, it really 
Oh, yeah, um, my upbringing, yes, it was always there. My parents never wanted to speak about this. My dad was very good. And now that I think about him, he, used, he, he did it on purpose, he and my mom, not to talk to us about tribes. I remember he used to tell us, do not judge people and put them in the boxes. If you said mm. those people are, then you are going to miss out many angels in your life because you don't know who God is going to send you when you need it the most. He always said people act on their own individually. If somebody acts mean to you, even if it's your own family, take space, but avoid to prejudge people because they come from that country, they are like that. Because they come from that race, that, that tribe. So we grew up knowing that you never have to look at the general thing they said they are like they, they are from there he's like no matter who did wrong to you avoid to put people in boxes wow. and yeah and i'm so glad for that yeah sounds like a very uh, good man um he was a leader i i have listened to your um, audio book i've left to tell many years mm -hmm. ago 10 years ago uh the lady who did the voice did a very good job she did all the different accents she did a great job um but uh, just uh, for our listeners uh sorry um yeah i, said, I, I People say, like, is it you? I'm like, no. <laughs> she did a good job. Um, but I wanted to ask, how many in the family, um, just so we know, how big was the family um, growing up? I had three brothers and me yep. and my mom and dad. But they were okay. home always with somebody, another kid from another family. Yes. My parents were caring for, paying school for, coming to live home. So it was always like my family was open door always. Every wow. single evening, we had at least three, four people coming to eat from neighbors. And then my mom had to cook for two, three more people. We don't even know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> so it was never like an invitation. You just have to cook more in case. Your, your, your father was told to be like, it uh, was a real leader in the community and many people respected him and would go to him for advice and leadership. Yes. Um, and, uh, T tell us now the day. I mean, in it was in April of 1994. Yes. The the airplane. What happened that caused this whole genocide to begin? So, as you were saying, the whole tribal stuff division. It really started at the time of colonialization when the Belgians mm -hmm. wander. The Germans came. It was fine. We didn't have any troubles with that. It's so funny because in Rwanda, they, they make a difference between Germans and Belgians. Like, the Belgians came to colonize. Then they divided the people, issued identity cards. But before, we, they didn't. Anyway, the problems came from there. Over 30 years, it was like political. You must divide. You are that tribe. You are this. So it have really become more... By 1994, we had about a million refugees, Tutsis, who have run away from the country. So these are the people who were asking, let us come back inside the country. But the policy was that if you cross the border, you don't come back to the country. So, oh, okay. yeah, so for like for 30 years, people like you couldn't even see your uncles who have just gone away from the country if they were in trouble. And that was something that was causing that little something. Like they knew there are Tutsis outside and they always threatened, if you want to come back, we, will, we are going to kill your brothers. So the day happened, I will still remember it was 1994. It was April 7th. One morning, my brother came to my room and he told me that the president of the country died and I remember jumping out of the bed and I told him, they are going to kill us. And then he said, why? Why they will kill us? It felt like that because of what I mentioned about the school. We knew we were discriminated. And then towards the genocide, there was radio for two years that used to insult us. It was like horrible. They would say like, look at them. They're not human beings. And then I'm like, why nobody's doing something to stop this? But mm -hmm. actually, it's because they were preparing it. So many people believe that, this is what we believe, that the president did not agree that they kill everybody under his mandate because he was the president. The world mm -hmm. would ask him about that. So when he didn't agree, and yet they were preparing a genocide, they killed him, his people, so then they can eliminate, have a reason to say, oh, let's blame them for that, and then kill everybody in, in, in our tribe. Like they killed the president. 
it was so sad. But the night before the genocide started, I remember my brother coming home. Like I said, I had three brothers. I was one girl and my mom and dad. My brother came home. He had just finished his master's degree. He was very ready to start life. And then he told the, my father that they are, they are dropping many people from a bad movement that was really violent. They were dropping them in every village because they were expecting to start killing that night. And the same night, the president died. So in the wow. morning, it just started, yeah. So it was very obvious that uh, this was to start uh, yes. what was going to follow afterwards, uh, which was instant, uh, I understand, instant killing happened yes. after that. Two years before that, the man who is actually to be believed, which have, who have been in prison with the United Nations, his name is Bagosora, the man who is believed to have been the brain to, to, to really, who was the head of that, he was the head of the military, and he was very powerful in the country. Two years before that, he saw the president who, who was like negotiating with the, the refugees from Tutsis who were outside of the country. He saw them ha- shaking hands, like, let's, let's agree on peace. And this man told the newspaper, this is something written. He said, I am going to prepare apocalypse for Tutsis, for people of my tribe. Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. He literally called it like that. So two years before that, we knew there is a man who we, who wished to, to create a genocide, but we used to think he can't do that. Yeah, he can How do you do that? How do you kill everybody? We just yes. never knew that this can exist. What was it um, generally uh, as far as violence? I know there was division. Was the violence very um, prominent in the country at the time leading up to this? So was it very dangerous? Did you ever feel unsafe um, in this time? those couple of years before the genocide? Would you ever feel very unsafe? Actually, it was like a year before. Mm-hmm. Before, we never felt unsafe, except you, you just knew you cannot go into politics, you cannot challenge the politicians, you just mm-hmm. have to keep quiet. And that what you were fine. You can't ask for a big position in a country, you just leave. So fate was a part of our life that was the most beautiful thing. You didn't need a big position. You just needed to love Jesus and to serve, the, you know, to serve God. However, a year before, they started to cause trouble. You would hear somewhere like a grenade blew up. You would hear some people like riots, which I, I don't like to see what I'm seeing right now, mm. you know, in the world. It's really not good at all. It, it, it sometimes it scares me because it put me back to that place. And then I'm like, you know, God is almighty. God who was there at that time, he's here even today. So now I need just to pray that this doesn't become, the, the, I don't know how it can be, but it, it does. There is evil preparation, definitely, that I felt in Rwanda. So for a year, a year before, two years, there was like people would go and like blow up a restaurant, just destruct, or put a grenade around where the schools and then there was chaos created almost willingly. I remember one time, right before the genocide, like months, I was in a bus. This man, bandits, pick up a woman, remove all her clothes, and took her bag. And the police was there. And the police was looking, didn't do anything. And I remember thinking, like, what is going on? Mm. Why is evil having this way of showing off where is the law this is a country where people did not even allow you to speak bad words why is it now so you can feel the progress towards the worst thing so you were i remember you were saying that you were actually leaving home at a particular time your father gave you these rosary beads Mm -hmm. um was that just before that plane went down or was it after it was after, so two days after, after it went down. So okay. right it went down, people, it is, again, I'm so grateful to this. When I time I think about it, my mm. parents really were trusted and people loved them. And uh, people had trust in them. Like they would give them a good advice. So the moment that happened, the next day we find out, people of my tribe, even the Hutu who didn't understand what was going on, they all came to my home, to, up to the soccer field where my mom was a teacher, we had about 10,000 people and everyone was asking my dad, what do we do? What do we do? Like he's supposed to be the leader who, and he would shout loud and scream 
and people would, would give each other messages, but he would talk loud and tell them, like, don't be scared. God is our God. Even if we die, we go to heaven. Let's reconcile with God. I was like, wow, he's strong. He believes yes. in God. Yes. And he's going to be, he, he will be maybe one of the people who will be killed, but he was still remember telling people, reconcile with God. This is our chance to make peace with God. And reconcile with each other. But do not be fearful. Fear is our worst enemy. And right there, as he was talking, he saw things were getting bad. Because there was another small group that would come and throw grenades around. And people, these 10,000 people, would just throw stones to people. Stones, like, go away, what are you doing? And um, with all that chaos, my father came to me. He handed me the rosary, and he asked me to go to hide. To a man who was from the, the Hutu tribe and who was a friend of my family. That's why I have been, I have seen many good people from yes. the other tribe and have seen many good people in my tribe and bad people. So, and then I saw even again, we will talk about that, but we had French soldiers who were supposedly helping the bad government. Yes. But there was another part of the soldiers who were against each other because they wanted to save us. So it was really like, it made me realize that individually, people are who they are. Don't judge people and don't put them in the boxes. That's right. Because you make so many mistakes and then you avoid good people because they look like the, somebody who hurt you. So true, so true. So, so did you go straight to uh, this house uh, of the, of the um, Hutsu? Yes, he gave me the rosary. I went, I truly left out of obedience to my father. I didn't want to go. I thought, what if I go and then something happened? But he said, I can't worry about people and what about you? I was one daughter among three boys. Every, mm-hmm. Even my brothers were like, go, go, please. You know, we need to make sure that you are safe. So I listened to my dad. I said, okay, fine, if you say so. I went to the neighbor. He put me to sit in this tiny bathroom. It was like 35 minutes away, walk, 30, 40 minutes. So I had to go through the forest because I already have started to see people around the road who were angry. And yes. it was like, it's me. This is my neighborhood. I haven't changed. We are friends. I like you. You like me. What's going yes. on? It was so confusing. But when I went to the Naman, I can also see it was bad. I met my teacher. You know the teacher I spoke about who used who told me one time like stand up in school and yes. he chased me out. I met him by the man who was who was the my the, where I was going to hide, and I gave him a hand. In Rwanda, everybody shake hands. You shake hands when you greet people. You shake hands when you leave. Yes. <laughs> so he's that So I went to shake him a hand, and he refused to give me his hand. It was the first time I said, "What is going on? Something is really bad." My teacher was like my father. If he says, sit down, I will sit down. He says, stand up, I will stand up. So like to see him like refusing to give me his hand, yes. it was an alarming situation. So the man pulled me, who was, you know, where I hid, the owner of the house. He, he gave me my hand, he pulled me back. He went to show me this home, like a room where we were. And the next morning he came to pick me from the room with a torch and showed me this tiny bathroom, like three by four feet. I remember three when by I, four feet. Yeah, Let me feet, feet, not meters, feet. Oh, one meter <laughs> by one, one meter. meter. Yeah. Wow. I couldn't lay down. I couldn't stretch. I could. It was if you go to the toilet like this, you you my 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 knees hit the wall. I had to oh. bend the toilet. Yeah, it was just a little longer, like one meter and a half. So the first time I got there, I was like, no, this, I can't be here. It's too small. You know, a part of me was still like, I, what is going on? You, I haven't come to accept it yet. So I was complaining, thinking that I deserve a better room. Yeah. Because again, like a part of me is like, no, it can't be. Because I haven't done anything wrong. You go to prison when you have done wrong. That's right. You know, you don't go because the way God creates you, it's a mistake. It can't be. You can't do this. So he put me to sit there. And I'm, again, I'm complaining. Before I even sit down, he brought five more women. And they were all in his house. 
Later, he brought two more women. We were eight people, three by four feet. We squashed were, it, it, it was it was small enough for one person. Now eight people are squashed in this. Uh, so there's no way of, uh, I mean, basically standing room only. Could you, you, you just sit down with your we knees? Were able to sit. We also had to sit because there was a window in the bathroom. So if we stand, they can see us. Uh, wow. We had to sit. The youngest, the two youngest had to sit on our lap. So you had to squish with your knees like this. And then one girl would just like push herself over us. So the man was nice. I still remember this was so kind of him. He was like, you are going to, like your bones are going to, to be broken. So he put like a pillows, like a kind of mattress. Uh. He pulled them and put the air. So at least we can bend on each other, but it yes. was on the ground. Yes. So we had to give each other a chance to go to the bathroom. But you know, one thing I now I, I realize that when you don't eat, you don't go to the bathroom many times. <laughs> yeah. So we were sitting in front of each other. But I don't remember one time. One time, I don't remember anyone going to the bathroom. I feel like God just raised it in my mind. And we were eight, so we went. But I Yeah, didn't. of course. Yeah. Did you so, did eat, right? I mean, I know how how did you survive? It was three months, I uh, the story we understand. How did you yeah. survive? In-, in, that, in that place we sat there, it, so many things happened during that time. My goodness. I always tell people one thing I discovered. The whole, we have a bigger world right here in our hearts. Much mm. bigger in the mind than what is outside. So we sat there in emotions that we, I, we really can't even really know until we are going through something and then we can realize. So the first week I remember I had these kind of emotions that were like this angry, impatience, unrealistic, because again, like I need to sleep, but you are in a war. You don't go to sleep. I need to lay down. I need to brush my teeth. I need to shower. But those things, oh no, I'm in a war. So it was like the bouncing from one emotion. Then I would feel angry. And then I would feel fear. At the end of the week, because of this kind of instability in my feelings, I asked the man who was hiding us to put a radio outside so that we can hear what was going on. He was kind. He put three radios, different channels, so we can hear what was going on in the country. I couldn't believe. The leaders of the country who used to hide you know, behind private radio, you are one people, but knowing they had bad things, they were out on radio calling everybody to kill every one of my tribe. I remember when the government minister, he said, don't forget children. We have to cleanse the country. I'm like, what? That's when I realized this is bad. So we knew now things were bad. So slowly they started to repeat like a day after, not like slowly, like a month later. They started to repeat people who are dying. Thousands, thousands. They started to give prices to people who were killing more people by machete. And then they, they were just like, oh, we destroyed the church here. We destroyed this. I'm like, what is going on? Slowly, and now they gave order to start searching every home. That is where I can say, this is really how to me I survived. It wasn't about sitting there. It was about the changes that were happening in my heart. So with all these emotions, when they started to come to search for that for us in that bathroom, that's when I really looked from in, from to inside, to see who I am, what is this feelings, what do I do about that? I, I remember the first time they came to search. I was stretching. I saw them through the window of the bathroom. I thought it was a thousand people because they were dressed in banana leaves. They had all kinds of arms, machetes. I saw them and they came inside and started to search everywhere. To me, the only reasonable thing that was going through my mind was, it's over. They found me. They're going to kill me. They're going to cut me in pieces. In that moment, knowing that I'm going to die, I felt like I had two voices over my shoulders. And one voice was telling me, open the door and the torture. They found you. And why wait if you know that you're going to die? So it felt reasonable. However, another voice, nothing strange, like, you know, the kind of thing, like give up, don't give up, do this, don't do that. This is wrong. When I don't care, let me just do it. Those kind of voices. And, and the nicer one, however, was telling me, do not open the door. 
ask God to help you. Remember who God is? God is almighty. Do you know what almighty means? It means he can do anything. Do you know what anything means? It means even if they open the door, they might not be able to see you. And to have that, this is one thing I wish everybody to be able to have. Just that little faith that they can hold on to God, keep running to him, even if the most obvious thing is they found you. Just don't give up prayer. Prayer is miraculous. Prayer is, you can really change anything. So Amen. now I have to choose what voice to listen to. But the voice of the evil one that was telling me they, found, they would find me, it's too late. I shouldn't even try to hide. He kept changing the mind. You know, God doesn't exist. Don't stop praying. I'm like, he doesn't? And, you know, like, it was so many little things. Like, voices, yeah. It was just a, a battle. And then I remember now literally asking God, if you are here, if there's anyone who created me, if there's anyone who put all this together, earth I'm standing on, the moon, the stars, if there is anyone who did all this, I am begging you, please don't let the killers find us today. All I wanted was the most important thing I was looking for was to believe without doubt. If I knew this before, I would have made my faith so strong so that nothing can ever, you know, move me. And that is to me, anytime, even when I'm speaking, I really, you you don't know what the world is going to give us tomorrow. We just went through coronavirus and we're still going through it. Right. You never know what temptation that can be there. But if you have faith, you can use it in any situation, no matter what cross that comes to you, no matter what temptation that comes to you. And you will be strong and you will be fine. Just hold on to God and keep praying no matter what. So, and that is, you know, yeah, the big message I just want to give people. So from that moment, I remember asking God, if you are there, give me a sign. And if you give me a sign, I promise you, I will not doubt your existence again. And I asked for a specific sign. They were inside the house. There were three to 400 people, men. And I asked God, if you can hear me, don't let the killers open the door today. Just today. It was a four bedroom house. There's no way you can think three, four hundred people can miss out one door in a four bedroom house. Only if God wants, who is almighty. So that I still didn't know what was going to happen. But when I said, don't let them open. And I knew I have just asked God for a sign. I fainted. I didn't hear anything until about five hours later, the man who was hiding us came and opened the door. I thought they found us. And it is then that he told us what happened. Five hours later, I was wow. still like frozen. I didn't look at any woman. I thought it was two minutes. And then he goes like, oh, you are still like this. That's what he told us he, when he opened. He's like, yeah, what happened? Are they there? They he said, no, they left a long time ago. So we started to breathe. And he told us that they came inside the house. They went under the beds. They went in a closet. They went in a ceiling of the house, oh, on the roof wow. of the house to search with flashlights in the ceiling. They went on the roof of the house to make sure no one was laying there. They opened suitcases to make sure no babies were hiding. A very, very thorough search of the whole place. The whole place. Lastly, he told us they came right to the bathroom of the house, of the bathroom where we were. He said he was sweating, he was shaking. And then one of the killer touched the handle. And before he opened, he told, the, he told the man who was hiding us, he goes like, you know what? Uh, we trust you. you. You are a good man. You cannot hide these bad people. Right where we were, wow. that's when he stepped back. When he told us uh, we were not allowed to speak to each other, I couldn't talk. But what really shocked me, he, he could never see in my heart was like, God is real. God is real. God is there. I will trust him. I will keep praying. I will never give up again. I will never listen to the bad voice. <laughs> he will sneak in right. however he wants. But at least he will not convince me anymore or try to play mm -hmm. on my page that stop praying. He's not there. The word that I did to me, it was everything. Now, my mind was like, only God is really right now. My parents are not there. 
the man who hides us, all he can offer us is that bathroom. He doesn't have any power. The people are looking for us. I wanted to know that almighty God is the only one who look who in the hearts, who can hear you even when you don't speak, who can hear you even when you don't open your mouth. I'm like, I need to know him. Yes. So I asked the man to give me the Bible. I had Rosary, my father have given me, and I started to read the Bible, trying to understand everything. Who are you? Why did you create me? Every little question I never dared to ask God, I was asking this time. Why did you create me? And why, uh, if you created me, what did you mean for me? How did you want me to live? And how long did you want me to be here? Where do we go when we die? It was like yeah. every question. All the I big questions, yes. Big questions we all ask. Yes, and I really felt like God was speaking back. I created you because I love you. Why parents have children? In the simplest way, I felt he was showing me. Why do, do parents have children? When they you want to get married, not just because you love each other, or let's just remain together alone. No, you want to have children. Because you want to love them. You want to share with them all you have, mm -hmm. teach them how to live, and share the gifts you have with them. You're right. So the same way God created, I created you so that I can share with you with my gift, my heaven, my everything. That makes sense. I just wanted to hear some answers. And then I remember asking, what am I supposed to do? How do I supposed to live? And I feel like God was like, look in the Bible. I gave you commandments. Love one another. Why this is going wrong? Why we are not at peace? Because we failed to love one another. That is the only answer I can come up with. If people loved one another, this would not have happened. If Very people true. were not greedy, what was going to ha was happening in our country would not. And now it is happening. I, I pushed it. I would ask God, so what about me? I think I was, I was good. I did good to people. And I feel like our Lord was saying, I made you a family. What hurts one person can hurt another. That's why we cannot pretend that is their problem, is not mine. We must pray for one another. Yes. We must help one another. We, what affect a country can spill to another country. So we must pray for one another. We love one another, no matter who is the person, where they come from. I'm like, okay, so where do we go? I felt like God was explaining to me too. In my heart somewhere, there is heaven and there is hell. And it's up to you, what do you work for? I'm like, no, I want to go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I even, I remember reading in the Bible, I'm like, so how is heaven? I always tell people, it's hard to work for a price if you don't know what the price is about. So you really, yeah, you need to kind of search what the Bible speaks about heaven mm -hmm. for you to want to work for it. Or people who have had an experience after life. So I remember reading the Bible, the roads in heaven are diamond and gold no more pain, yes. no more getting older, no more sickness. I'm like, that sounds good. <laughs> like, who doesn't want that? Then I started to see, how do you get there? Depends again how you live here on earth. And that's my decision was, that's it, I'm going to follow God. So, and I remember reading in the Bible, so like a pray unceasingly. I took it literally. I took the rosary and I started to pray. <laughs> From morning until night. I mean, I had all my time. Of From course, yes. From until night. And then the transformation started to come in. I remember one prayer that really shook me was our Lord's Prayer, which is a part of the rosary. Mm -hmm. Anytime I will reach this part, because now I decided I want to be true to God. And he said he can do all things, and I will watch him too. I will see what he can do. But I need to do my part. You can't tell somebody, yeah, if you want to tell a friend that you have each other, I promise everyone had to do their part for that to happen. Otherwise, one drops, you can't just keep the promise alone. So I'm like, let me do my part and see what he does. So I'm praying and I just want to be sincere with God. And then anytime I reach to this part that said, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those, I'm like, no, I hate them. <laughs> That's I hate the hard them. one. <laughs> and I hated them. 
I remember hate, like hate was so big in me, fear and hate. Those were two things, emotions that were eating me, hate and, and fear. Hate, I would think about it. I'm like, is I'm so right. I hate them. Look at what they're doing to me. They're killing children. They're killing. And then the hate becomes a sickness. You hate not only one person who is even hurting you. You hate everybody who look like them. You hate the whole family. You hate the whole tribe. So it was like becoming consuming me. And I started to have a headache. I had a stomach ache. My blood was aching. My body was aching. My smile, I couldn't smile. I felt like my face was twisted. But what do you do with what they do to you? I felt that was the consequences of that. To a point where I started to wonder, I wish I can forgive. I can't forgive. How do you forgive somebody who is killing your mom, your dad? It can't be. So with all that thinking about it, Anytime now I reach that part, forgive as we forgive, I'm like, no, I can't. But God looks in my heart. So I'm lying to him. Even if I have a good reason to be angry, but I'm lying to him. How do I do this? So a part of me just wanting to be sincere to God, I started to skip that part of the prayer. Because I didn't want to say and lie to God. If he looks in the heart, he knows the truth. And if you lie to a friend, you are risking to lose that friendship, especially when you keep lying without even asking for forgiveness. I'm like, what do I do? So I skipped that part until one day I was about to skip it. And I felt as if somebody was touching me and reminding me, hey, I hope you know that the person who gave those words is God himself. Jesus, he's the one who said, pray this way. So if I were you, I wouldn't change his prayer. And again, what do you do? For the first time in my life, I understood the meaning of surrendering. I went on my knees and I told God, let your will be done. If you say so, I need to do so. I don't need to know how to forgive for me to will to forgive. I need to ask God, help me. The same way I was asking him in the bathroom, protect me, the same way I need to ask him, change my heart. Why? Not because it feels good to forgive, but because the God I believe in says so. Pray this way. If I'm a Catholic, I have an obligation to be sincere to God. And if I can't do a certain thing like or respecting his commandment, I need to ask him at least to help me. If I'm a Christian, I had guidance. I need the I have things I need to follow to do to be called a Christian. It's not just by word, by name. And when I realized that, then I I wanted to fit in Christianity. I wanted to fit in Catholic. And wherever I was weak, I wasn't fitting in. I would ask God, help me. I want to know, how do you love your enemies? How do you pray for them? And you know what? A moment came. And I was able to let go the anger. It felt so good. This is powerful. Um, now, all this is happening, by the way. You're in the bathroom, reading the Bible, praying the rosary. You have the women around you squashed in the room. You're having mm-hmm. this conversion. But, uh, yeah, tell us now, after three months, and you're hearing the radio, all the, the killing, piles of bodies, um, It was, and then you did discover um, your own family. Um, the, to tell us now how when you escaped the bathroom, what, what happened when, when it came to the end? Tell us a bit about that. And then you got to meet the actual uh, murderer. Yes, yes. So we, we spent three months in that bathroom. Mm. Everything, the forgiveness, the freedom, it really happened in my heart when I was still there. So when we came, I still wasn't sure if are they really dead. I, I have heard many things outside, so I wasn't sure. But I didn't want to accept it that maybe they are dead. They were killed. But the very first night I came out, the soldiers took us, they put us in a refugee camp, you know, when they were collecting people from wherever they were hiding. And the first hour, I had to find somebody. Anyone knows about my family? Anyone? And that's when I found out everybody was killed. My mom was killed, my dad, my two brothers, my grandma, my grandpa, my neighbors, my schoolmates. I found out everyone was killed. 
a million people was killed in a period of three months. A million people. I just just can't understand that. A million people. That's a lot of people. Yes. Um, it, it was. Uh, it's described as, uh, and as you describe in the book, even people you knew, uh, friends of yours, it was almost like uh, they were possessed. Uh, um, th- something came over them. It was like, that's it. They're part of this tribe and they have to kill the other tribe. But um, no matter what, they couldn't see humans anymore. You were even described as cockroaches, um, according to what I understand in the story. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, so tell us now, you actually did meet um, the man who was responsible for killing your family. Um, and what was that encounter like? So with the refugee camp, we stayed there a few weeks and then we moved to the city where I, I got somebody who says she knew my mom and she took me to her home. I started to look for a job, got a job in the UN. And then I started to say, I need to go back to home to see how they destroyed my home. And this was like three, four months later. When I went to, the, to the, my home, they have destroyed it. I knew the man because he was looking for me. He used to come outside of the bathroom because they came many times to search. And he would say, he's only missing Imakile, me, in the wow. whole family. But then I'm like, oh, he doesn't know. Maybe they're h- still hiding. But it was also my way not wanting to cry because I couldn't cry. So I deny like it didn't happen. I would, I would deny. So anyway, I went to see my home and then I went to visit the prison. When I got there, because the man have taken everything from my home, I remember the head of the jail told me, come, let me show him to you and do whatever you want. Hit him if you wish, you know, ease up your pain. And my fear was that I had so much peace. Forgiveness brought me so much peace, even if I was still crying. And to this day, I still cry. So it's not like yeah, of course. when you meet somebody you love, you will always love them. So I went to the prison and the man brought this guy. I remember the first thing I felt in my heart, I broke down and cried. I cried so hard. It was so sad to see him. A part of me, I wasn't crying just like, oh, look how bad you did. What I was crying for, he was a man like, like you, I, who used to wear dress nice, dress nice suit, proper, had a beautiful family. His children were my age. I would always respect him like a father. And now he was so dirty. His hair was upside down. He hadn't shaved in his, uh, many months. He, his feet, I remember, were swelling. They had beaten him a lot. You know, this was a time when, like, they caught you. It was bad. And um, his, his clothes haven't washed in for how many months. And when I saw him, I just cried. I cried. And I reached out to him that I forgave him. And when I reached out to him, what I really wanted to say to him was in my heart. I couldn't talk. I was crying. I wanted to tell him, don't have me as an excuse. I just wish you to free from me. Because, you know, when you have hurt somebody, you still feel guilty. Like, look what I did. I wanted to know that I, I forgave him so he can go through his own heart and wonder, why did I do what I did? So that if his children come to see him, He can tell them, never do what I did. It's bad. I just wanted him to go his own, through his own journey and be free like I was free. Because I was hateful. I was hateful in the bathroom. I thought if I come out, I would be a soldier to revenge, not Mm. to do. So I remember that time when the anger was eating me. And I remember the freedom I found. Actually, the reason to realize that if I have become like the killers, have killed people, or have even wanting to do bad, who is better? You know, I the, the same thing I hate, I wanted to do it. So it was really just like when I was able to let go the anger, it was a revelation. It wasn't, it wasn't just being nice, like, okay, I forgive you. It was more like, I get it. They, they don't know what they do. They're doing evil. And I want to do the same evil? It doesn't make sense. I don't like what they're doing. So my forgiveness was really come from my heart where I felt a huge change that I don't need to compete with evil. I need to pray because I believe in the power of prayer that people can change. And if I'm in a position of advising or maybe in leadership, if ever, which 
or now that in a position of like a writer, a speaker, I will always voice my voice in ways that I can help other people to see. But I don't need to compete with evil. I need to speak love, like Mandela, like Mother mm-hmm. Teresa, like Gandhi. Those were the people who were like my models. I love this because um, it goes against the, the the natural feeling. I mean, of course, people will understand you want to have revenge against these killers. Um, mm-hmm. Naturally, of course. But but you had this radical encounter inside of that bathroom with God. And this is what takes um, the faith in our lives to a whole new level. When you, someone like you who can forgive the murderers, you lost your family. Um, and this is very difficult. Um and many of us today complain about very minor things, um, be you know, cut off in traffic or certain someone called me a bad name. or But, you know, we start to bl- think about, hang on, I've got to start counting my blessings. Um, w- we are very fortunate. Uh, many people are in a worse position. But you, when you did that, you'd speak about this freedom. And this is the clue here. Um, like Jesus talks about love your enemies. Now, here you are facing what you would think is your enemy but you did love him and you had this freedom. How do we get this freedom? I mean, this freedom is what the world is is is, is wanting, is desiring. We think we know what freedom is, but yeah. true freedom, please explain the difference between true freedom and you know, I guess the world's yes. idea. Oh, thank you. So true freedom, true freedom is now I don't take it as something like I want to be free i want to be it's not like something a goal you just go and obtain it's a result mm. of behavior is a result that came from loving is a result that came from wanting to understand other people and that it was what happened to my heart when i wanted to be kind and to understand so when i was able to forgive that's when i felt i feel free i feel peace and it really, as a Catholic, it, it's really hard for me to separate my faith with what I lived through because faith was everything that led me to that. However, I'm sure people can find forgiveness in many different ways. Me, to me, the freedom came from wanting to apply my faith to the most honest way possible. Being sincere with God. God if I believe in God, I want to be sincere. And I want to be sincere to my friends too. If I mean I love somebody, I care, I, I'm faithful, I want to do that, exactly what I say. But the true freedom came from wanting to be sincere to God. He said, forgive. I want to forgive. Now I reach somewhere, I don't even know if I can forgive. Because many times I will say, okay, I forgive them. Then I will wake up with anger. I'm like, it's still there. So the freedom wasn't there because the anger was still there. Then I remember also reading in the Bible, ask, it shall be given. Knock, the door will be open. So my next step is, let me ask God to help me. If I can trust him to protect me in this bathroom, why can't I trust him to change my heart? So the freedom comes with loving. The person who loves is free, but is loving everybody. Because one person can hold you a prisoner, the one you, you hate. But so it is, to me, the secret is in the Bible. It's forgiving, but forgiveness cannot happen if you you don't love. And love cannot happen if you really don't apply the principles of the Bible. Pray, because the world pulls us in so many directions. Don't, you know, they hate you. They, that, you know, it's, it's hard to love naturally. Somebody's hating you if you don't have behind it if you truly don't want to apply. What I love about God is that the things of the Bible, when you apply them to love, the prayer, you see the result. Your heart start changing. So the freedom comes from forgiving, from loving, and it comes with prayer. I, I love it. Um, and uh, hopefully it's a reminder for us, those who do know better and pray the Our Father, remember those lines, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You are a living example of this, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. What a witness. I, I just, um, I know we're coming towards the end here and I just want to make sure we get some um, some messages for people to follow up on. Um, uh, if I can at least congratulate you, your your message isn't just um, telling people what happened, but you actually have a powerful message of, of 
of the faith, um, forgiveness, but also the power of God and power of prayer. And you say it with so much conviction because you have been saved. Um, and you speak to like IBM and and these big corporate companies, but you don't hold back. You, you, you give them the message of faith. And it's a beautiful witness to see um, if you could give encouragement to people now watching who are Catholics um, or Christians or, or, or faith-based, but who may not think, oh, we shouldn't talk about the faith in public. You you don't hold back. I've seen you uh, talk to audiences. Yes. How do, where do we get that courage from? What we, can we do to just speak the truth in love to anyone? Oh, thank you so much. You know, I realize people really are good, actually, way more than people think. People are good at heart. When you tell your story and you, te- you speak about your faith without attacking people, people listen. Speak about what faith have done to you and what it has done for you. You know, I have gone to places, like you said, people come and touch the rosary. And one lady, I remember she told me, oh, I have seen this with my grandma. I forgot about this. It really did this to you? I'm like, yeah, it's really a good prayer. And then she says, so I have gone to Mormons, different groups, people who don't really care much about anything about God. But what people are interested in, they want to hear your experience. Yes. What has done to you? How is your Catholic faith help you? Not just the principles. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do this. What have been going to confession did to you? I was speaking to a friend of mine the other day. She told me how she literally was asking for a divorce because she was just crying and she was sad and she didn't know what was going on, but she didn't want anything of her life. She went to see a priest and the priest said, okay, let me give you confession first. And she haven't had a confession in 30 years. She did a confession. After she finished doing confession, the priest said, go home and come back Monday. We can talk about your husband. She came back. She's like, I have nothing to talk about my husband. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't see anything wrong anymore. So you see, the people oh. who have experienced faith and the things of faith, if you have seen the power of the rosary, it's hard not to talk about it. And let me tell you, people who don't know about God, they are yearning to hear an experience with God. Somebody who, who love God and how God acts in their life. And what it means, because some people don't have an idea. I remember one time I met another person who actually converted through our conversation and it was so hard for him to express. He's like, really, you have peace. You look like you have peace. And why, why, what makes you happy? You look like, I'm like, well, I pray the rosary. I go to mass, I go to confession. I read the Bible, all the secrets are there. Yes. And uh, (laughs) this man, And after time, it was so hard for him to say, we were meeting in prayer groups and and like somewhere volunteering. And he goes like, can I ask you a question? How do you pray? And this is a Catholic person. And he was literally almost crying. Can you just tell me how they pray? How do you do it? Like I sit in front of God, I don't know what to say. I'm like, he knows me, I see him, he's there and he sees me and I I don't see him, he sees me. What is to say? (laughs) It was so sweet. And then I rendered him a movie about St. Padre Pio, the saint you know, who have lived through normal life. Yes. And then I just speak to God and say, here I am. I want to feel you. I want to know you. Even that, I invite you. I open my heart to you. Help me. Be here. I want to feel your presence. And this person has become very strong in his faith. So people yeah. are hungry for faith. Those who have it, Please don't shy to speak about your own experience, not telling people you have to do this, but speak the beauty and the, the good experience of God, of, of your faith. Amen. Praise God. I yes. um, encourage anyone watching now, get a copy of the Left to Tell book. Um, I will try track down how to get more supplies in Australia. I'd like to do a shout out. In those in, in, in Australia, you can visit your local Catholic bookshops Um uh, a shout out to Cardinal Newman Center, who I know have had this and, and others, but uh, get in touch and get in touch with us. We'll, we'll look at the suppliers and try to get this book left to tell both the, the physical book and there's the audio book. But there are other books too, Macaulay. Since the story left to tell went out, you did write a follow up book and then and then a few others as well. Can you tell us about uh, what, yeah. what what's out there now? So I have written a second a sequel to Left to Tell called Led by Faith. 
And then I wrote one of my best book called, which I consider really my, one of my biggest mission called Our Lady of Kideho. Okay, yes. So the Virgin Mary who appeared in Lourdes as she appeared in Fatima, where Mexico City, and many everywhere in the world, really. She appeared in Rwanda in a place called Kibeho. And she said, she, she predicted the genocide. So she said it was going to happen. And she said, my children, if you don't change, this is what was going to happen. So the, we knew, we knew from the perspective of Our Lady. She, and she said, we can change the future by reciting the rosary. We can wow. actually change the future by just applying the principles of the, of the Bible, obeying God's commandment, but daily, not sometimes. And then do, she used to say, don't wear your faith like a jacket you put on when you go to mass and then remove it. Oh, it's a powerful. Wow. Isn't it? Very and she true. said, the way of living, take it to work, apply it when you talk to people, love them, have God within your heart when you do see them, see God in everybody. I'm like, wow. So anyway, she, it came true. She also asked us in Kibeho that she would like a church to be done, actually a basilica. And one of the mission I'm doing is to help the bishop there to build the church Our Lady asked for. Our Lady gave the measurements of the church, how big she wants it, yes. And she gave a land of where she wanted. So it is not done yet. I just created a foundation and I called our, our Lady of Kibeho Basilica, you know, and um, yeah, I, I'm working on it. If God, I hope that God helped me too. We, we will put uh, some links. Do you, do you have the, the link there um, or yeah. where can people go? So you can go to buildkibeho.com or you can go to immaculate.com, my first name.com. Uh, yes. Okay. We'll oh. make sure we put that in the comments. Uh, please visit that and, and support as much as you can. We will we will do what we can. Is there a feast day in the year of Our Lady of Kibeho? Is there a... a is there a feast, a special day the church yes. has for her? Yes. Do you mind? I can actually show you. Yes. My picture, you see, okay, that's her. Oh, well, let me just make sure we yes. this up. Oh, yes. Yes. So that's her in the blue. And uh, this is a CD I made of her messages. Wow, yes. beautiful. So that yeah. is available uh, through the website, uh, immaculate.com. Yes, in Macra.com. And the Vatican approved it in 2001. It is the only approved apparition in Africa. And wow. I, I'm just happy because I grew up with that and I knew the message. We knew what can happen. And I feel like I, I left, I think I already negotiated my life with God <laughs> and Selene has say, so she can be a witness of the past and, and the now. And then, because so many things have been burned. And remember when I was doing interviews, I mean, I, I meet the visionaries. They are still alive, two of them. Oh, wow. wow. Who have been approved, yeah. But when I was investi doing an investigation and writing the book, I went to the bishop and he would ask me like, how do you know that? That's a long time ago. I mean, I was 10 years old when it started. But okay. I, my heart was there from the beginning. This was... It was as if like something shook you. I mean, our lady, I love her so much. I love her. I do. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. This is beautiful. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, you had other books as well, right? Since then. That so that's yeah. three. There's even more. And I wrote a book called The Boy Who Made Jesus, is one of the visionary in Kibeho. Actually, I'm in, in negotiating a contract for a movie about that one. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. We'll look out for that. We'll pray for this. Yeah, please do help me. So we are talking about that, and which is a great story. So much for this time, because one of the, the main message, our Lord was telling him to tell people to prepare every day, because they don't know when the world will end, and also individually when our life can end. So he was giving him things like, this is how the world will end. Always stand ready, love other people, pray a prayer that shows in action by caring about other people. So he's, he was good. He was a pagan. He never knew anything about God. He, he, the, the sweet thing about it, this book, many people love it more than any other book. He was so good at asking Jesus questions. Like, mm -hmm. why did you create us with weakness, knowing what we can put, we can put ourselves in trouble? He would ask him questions like, what? You don't say that. Don't ask. <laughs> but it was good for many people. 
another book I wrote is called The Rosary. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I wrote about the Station of the Cross, but I always put my own personal stories. I really think that what most people, like so people can come and give me the whole theology. If I don't see how it will affect me, it's hard to understand what to even want to, to do. But if you tell me like that lady who went to confession and said, my marriage is good because my heart is clear and happy because I went to confession and I thought I needed a divorce. So everybody wants to go to confession. People heal sicknesses just because they went to confession. So there's so many personal experiences in my writings, the rosary book. I really spoke about how I came to love the rosary. The miracles have happened in my life through the rosary. Wow. So every book is more about the stories and yeah. Beautiful. Well, all this is available through your website, immaculate.com. Immaculate.com. See everything there. Um, well, I encourage everyone to go visit um, immaculate.com. Please pray for this woman, uh, a powerful witness of Christ and his church, um, and still going out today. And even in the lockdown, you've been active, you know, you've been um, yes. yeah, dedicating daily prayers. <laughs> and you have a big group uh, praying together. <laughs> we started thinking, like, can I really do this, like, a week every day? Or we pray for like three hours every day. Wow, three hours. <laughs> yeah, we said the rosary and we said a, a rosary called Seven Sorrows Rosary. Actually, this is a Seven Sorrows Rosary. It has seven okay. headers and the seven sorrows. It always existed. And Our Lady. Ah, uh, yes. Has, yes. And, and Our Lady reminded one visionary in the Kibeho that the world needs it more than ever today. Seven Sorrows Rosary. But the Vatican said it always existed, and Our Lady said it always existed. But she wants the world to remember now. And so many miracles have been happening through this prayer. So we say wow. this every day. We meditate on the tears of Our Lady, the prophecy of Simeon, the flight into Egypt, when Our Lady was under the cross, receiving the body of Jesus. When you go through them, like your heart will heal. Because you wow. are, they always put yourself in, your, in my shoes. What if it was you? So the more you think about her sorrow and her, what Jesus did for the world, for us, the more you open your heart to accept your own suffering. It's so healing. It's beautiful. That's powerful. Powerful. Thank you. Um, just in closing, um, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, you, you've been back to Rwanda a few times now. and uh, times. I go there every maybe three times a year. Four. Oh, wow. Okay. Very good. I take pilgrimage. And I have taken people from Australia. Oh, good. I would love to encourage. How to, um, do, would that be on your website as well, all the information? Yeah, my next oh. trip is August. Okay. Oh, please, I God. Have great friends, Carmo, you know. Yes, I, like. I know. You have the most beautiful people. I truly have <laughs> many great friends in Australia. Well, we and, would love to have you here one day um, again. You've been here once. I'd love to have you back. I, I want to. I want well, to. Let's pray for that. We'll pray for that. Um, what's your final? Um, uh, by the way, just right now, the, is is Rwanda in? Um, uh, how is it now? As peaceful as a country? Uh, there's no more tension between the the, the tribes. Is it all ended now? Um, you know, I think the new government have done really great. The okay. tension ended like in three months, it, but consequences were forever. Yes, yes. So many people died. However, one of the things, for example, they did. We used to have identity cards in every a driver license. You will have they will have to write who you are. I'm a Tutsi, I'm a Hutu. Now they remove that. If you do an exam before a teacher, a student, you have to write who you are if you are Tutsi or Hutu. Now you don't write anywhere. You are just at one Excellent. So they have done amazing thing. The country have gone high up there like this. But I give credit to the leaders, of course, they are working, but to our lady. Our Lady mm. said in Rwanda before, she said this country, no matter how bad things will be, it will rise again. Because many people who have come to pray and accepted her. So we see it today when I go there, I'm like, people don't believe it happened there. Wow, wow. Well, this praise. well, we are out of time. I want to thank you so much uh, for being with me today and, and, and our audience uh, we are all praying for you and your ministry. Please keep going, keep being that light of Christ to the world and and uh, and talking about the power of prayer and freedom 
may the world receive this freedom you talk about, the true freedom uh, mm -hmm. from the faith in God. Your final message to us all, what would be one just take home message as we close? And if I could invite you then to close in prayer as well after that. One message I want to tell people, you know, I always have to remember that when you go through pain, like what I was going through, even pain individually in many different ways, you are alone. You are in, it's your heart and your God and you. And I just want to tell everyone, anyone who is going through pain, I mean, this is a time of this pandem mm. pandemic, whatever you might be going through, please remember, there's always hope. Hold on to God. Don't give up. Prayer can change everything. So don't give up. Even when people die, there is heaven. The worst thing is to lose hope and then to feel desperate. And I truly believe when we're praying, if you are meant to go and pass to the other side, God will give you peace to accept it. But if you have a desire to continue to live, pray, pray. God listen to us. So not to lose hope. That's what I would ask people. And lastly, please pray. Hold on to your God. You have you, a father who sees you inside. Talk to him. Tell him your desires. It doesn't have to be formulated in a nice or different way. Just speak to him as you speak to a good friend. Yeah, but make it daily. Many great that, things. Very true. good. Yes. Consistency. Powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to EWT and Asia Pacific who are streaming this. Thank you to all the followers there on the Perusia podcast uh, group as well as the page and please visit our website perusiamedia.com and we'll be promoting more and more of these podcasts each week visit immaculate.com do yourself a favor let us close in prayer would you mind closing in prayer for us immaculate yes and i want to tell people those who pray the rosary or who don't is the most powerful prayer i already said whatever you ask for she will give you an answer and a favorable mm -hmm. answer so i want to encourage you for that Thank let's you with the our lord is prayer as our lord taught us and as you are watching the if i would not have forgiven i would not be here today and if i would be here i would not be smiling and really loving and having a family and loving my life loving every day not just my yes. life loving god loving every day so as we get to that part forgive me as as we forgive i just want you to dare you please think about somebody you haven't forgiven and if you can't forgive easily now, just ask God, help me. I want to forgive that person. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. You are Thank so you good. Thank you very much. So good to have you. That's another Perusia podcast. I'm going to stop the